Good morning. Here at River Watch, when we start the day, we pull off the rafts, wash them, pump them, and get them set up for the students. So that way when they come, the rafts, the paddles, the sign spins, and all the bins that they're going to put their gear into are ready and willing for them to get on the river. Here's the beginning of the day. Students are coming off full of excitement and they're ready for the day. As guides, you'll be greeting teachers and greeting students, making them feel at ease. At this point, the students have been welcomed into Riverwatch and now they're in a safety talk because most students have never been on the river before, so safety is a huge concern. We put them at ease by talking about personal protection equipment, PPE. This includes PFDs, which are personal flotation devices, as well as rubber boots, as well as common problems or hazards on the river, like falling out of the boat into the river, um, coming into problems with obstacles like strainers and sweepers, as well as bridge pillars. So it puts the students at ease and gets them in the right frame of mind. What is it about Riverwatch itself that, uh, that convinced you to come out and to take part in it? I think coming down here and being able to do the water testing uh, upriver and downstream, it's a great program for the kids to be able to get a real hands-on approach and see what's really happening in their environment and take an active role in that. It's a really great experience for kids just to be, first of all, to have them out of the school is really, really good for them. There's a lot of team building that happens yeah. and to have them outside for the whole day is a really remarkable experience for them. Kids have a great time. They love the guides because the guides, you're very good at picking guides because guides are, they um, are really good with our kids. They know how to talk to our kids, they know the right kinds of questions to ask and they also have a vast amount of knowledge. At this point, the students are being told about that personal protection equipment, namely a PFD, a pair of rubber boots. The students walk through the bus, get fitted, and then come off the bus. At that point, they'll put the PFD on first to ensure that they don't put it down and it gets dirty, and then put their boots on. They'll hold on to the gear and their shoes, and that'll be put in bins that are in the rafts. As a river watch guide, you need to understand that this raft is your own, it's your office, it's your workplace. So as a guide, you need to command the respect of your students. It's all about safety here at Riverwatch. PPE, PFD, boots, the paddles are really all secondary to the ability of you being able to conduct a safe and enjoyable tour for your students. During the day, students are mostly the power. They're going to be lifting your rafts and walking with your rafts. When you're lifting the rafts, you want to make sure that students are lifting with their legs and not their back. Okay, at this point, the raft is really close to the water. You don't want the students to be going too close to the water, so what we do is a hand conveyor belt. Your feet stay firmly in place and you just move your arms and thus the raft moves. This ensures that the students get, don't get anywhere close to the water. At this point, we want to tell the students how to get into the rafts. We do what's called a shimmy. We use our knees and we are on the sides of the rafts, leading our body weight in and moving into the back of the raft. This is extremely important. We only want the students getting in on the front of the raft where there's actually land to step off of and onto the raft. <laughs> At Riverwatch, our paddles are one of our most important pieces of equipment, but they can also be the most dangerous piece of equipment. So we're just gonna go a little bit over what a paddle is. A paddle has three parts. First, we've got the blade. It's 100% waterproof. Make sure the students put it all the way in the water. This will ensure a full stroke and allow us to go forward at full strength. Next, we have the shaft. The black part of the shaft is where the student ideally is going to hold on to. Last but not least, we have a T-grip. You're gonna hold on to the T-grip by making an A-OK -okay sign and putting it over the T-grip. You always wanna ensure that you hold on to the T-grip can be a very dangerous element in Riverwatch. If the blade is in the water and hits something, the T-grip can fly off 
and hit another student in the face. So we want to ensure that all students are holding onto the tea grip. Once they have the proper handling, you want them to be sitting on the side of the raft with their feet underneath the thwart. This allows them to get nice good leverage for paddling. We have two strokes here at Riverwatch. The first one is a forward stroke. We put our blade completely in the water with our shaft perpendicular and pull backwards with our body. The second stroke is a backward stroke. We use our hip as a pivot point and put the blade as far back as possible and push it forward, thereby pushing the boat backwards. Two strokes. Behind my shoulder is a sweeper. It's a tree that hangs over the bank and has the potential to sweep students off of the raft. We avoid them. But if it does happen, what will happen is you'll have a sweeper with a raft that comes over and sweeps the students completely off. It's a good thing to avoid. Behind me is another type of hazard. It's called a strainer. These are made up of logs or trees that have floated down the river and have stopped for some reason. You can see them or sometimes you can't. What will happen is the logs or trees will be stationary in the water. Your boat will be moving along and will hit them. The water will be strained through, but your boat won't. The best rule, just avoid them. Another hazard here at Riverwatch is bridge pillars. Like all of our hazards, the best course of action is to just simply avoid them. If that's unavoidable, you'll want to deflect your boat off of the bridge pillar at an angle. If that doesn't happen, you'll end up broadsiding the pillar. At this point, the upstream current will push the downstream side of your boat up. You'll be riding the pillar. Your students will have been prompted at the intro talk when you yell high side to run to the high side of the boat, thereby counterbalancing the weight of the boat and pushing off. Again, best course of action, avoid bridge pillars. Sometimes the river can move extremely fast. When we need to slow down the program, We'll pull into an eddy, it's called eddying up. This will give us a moment to talk about what's happened and what's to come. This is a great moment to field questions from students and to ask them what they've seen so far. Most students haven't been on the river or been in a natural setting because they're extremely urbanized. They'll have a lot of curiosity. We use features on the river to help us move down the river. When we move into an eddy line or another feature, we want to ensure that we have direct control of our students so that way we move through the eddy line or any other feature without a problem or conflict. It's all about safety. You really need to watch out for those light riffles on the top of the water. That's going to denote that there's rocks underneath and that there's a shallow gravel bed. And as we can see behind me, they've gotten stuck. Sometimes it happens. Best course of action, prevention. What's really important when you're going down the river is to talk about the inputs into the river. Where does that water come from and what are the potential sources of contamination? Behind me you'll see a storm outfall. Storm outfalls come from storm sewers, which potentially can come from streets. So hypothetically anything that goes onto a street can flow through a storm sewer and end up in the water. It's important that students make these connections and remember this so that way when they go home they have some conservation in mind. They're not going to throw any litter onto the street. Here we are at test site one. There's a few things you want to think about when you're choosing a good test site. One is you've got a shallow shoreline to pull the boats up on. Second, you've got a nice level place to put those test kits on. And three, you want to find good places for washroom opportunities for the students. Let's move on to the testing. Here at Riverwatch, one of our most important questions to ask is how healthy is our river? To answer that question, we have our onboard science bin. In it, we have eight tests. We have four chemical tests. One is phosphate, dissolved oxygen, ammonium nitrates, and pH. Our three physical tests are temperature, turbidity, and velocity. And our two biological tests is a water sample that we later culture to see what kind of bacteria is in the water, as well as an aquatic invertebrate sampling to see what kind of life is in the water. Our most difficult test, though, is dissolved oxygen. In all of our test kits, you'll find instructions. Have the students read it line by line. You'll find chemicals, as well as glassware. Here with the dissolved oxygen test kit, the DO bottle, dissolved oxygen bottle, and the DO dissolved oxygen waste bottle 
can be confused by students. River water goes in here, waste water goes in here. In bottle, out bottle. Try and make it simple for them. So Fiona, the backbone of River Watch's award-winning program is water quality testing. And we have our students come and they do the experiments themselves. So we want to ensure that they don't fall for some of the common pitfalls. One of them I find is that they want to put their test kits on the ground so that way the glassware doesn't break. Definitely. Yeah. I also think it's important to tell them where all the gear is, you know, they can find their safety equipment, their goggles, their glasses, the trash bag. Yeah, absolutely. As well as to read all the instructions and then come talk to us. So that way they're not taking up all of our time, which is extremely valuable to walk around and see how the students are doing. For sure. I always tell them to read the instructions first. If they don't know what to do, ask their buddy to read the instructions. And if they still don't know what to do, then they can come and ask me. Absolutely. And our chemical tests, they have wastewater bottles, right? Mm -hmm. And I find sometimes that the students think that wastewater means river water. So I find it's super helpful to be extremely exacting with them and say, this is wastewater bottle. No river water will ever go in here. Exactly. I also think it's important to tell them where to take their test results from. Yeah. When they're collecting water, I tell them to go out as far into the moving current as they can without getting their boots wet. Absolutely. There are holes in the boots. At the top. They're at the top, for sure. If you've ever wondered why we have test site one and test site two, the reason is directly over my shoulder. The effluent from a wastewater treatment plant. Potentially, that water that's going into the river has nutrients, nutrients from human impact. We can test for human impact at test site two using our water quality tests. This will help us in the greater scheme of things to understand that great question, how healthy is our river? Here we are at test site two. Why do we have a test site two? Because test site one is our control. We've already tested the water. So now between test site one and test site two, we have human impact. We have the effluent from the wastewater treatment plant. Here at test site two, we do the exact same test to find out if there's a difference in water quality. We'll now compare those numbers and bring some conclusions to the day. At this point, the students have isolated the aquatic invertebrates. They're going to be using turkey basters as a vacuum to pull up aquatic invertebrates, put them into each one of these chambers, take an identification chart, and ID what they found. As we're downstream from the effluent from the wastewater treatment plant, we're looking to see if the composition of the nutrients within the water has changed what type of aquatic invertebrates we're finding. Oh, Fiona, you got the whiteboard. I have. Excellent. So these are all the numbers from our eight tests today. They are indeed. And this way the kids can uh, have a look at their results from both tests and help to draw some conclusions, hopefully. Right. So we have the numbers and we're going to set them up for success so that way they can draw their own conclusions. Yeah, that's the exciting part about it. They get to become the scientists. They make their own conclusions from the numbers that they've found today. Oh, that's fantastic. Fiona, a great day on the river can be ruined by a bad takeout. It certainly can, and the key to a good takeout is preparing the kids beforehand. So really telling them step by step what's going to happen. Exactly, because as soon as they hit shore, they're tempted to run up to their bus and forget about everything else. So we're in control as guides right up to the moment that they walk on their bus and drive out of, well, our lives really. <laughs> That's correct. Excellent. Anything else you think is really important at the takeout? I think a really good strategy is like these rafts are behind us, preparing the kids in the eddy because you're waiting there for a while until it's your turn anyway. 
So as you're coming up or beforehand, letting them know what's happening, what's coming up, so that way they can execute it flawlessly. Exactly. Also a good strategy, watching the raft in front of you. They're a great example of what you should be doing. Excellent. Let's go take a look at putting the gear away. Sounds good. So here we are, end of the day, trying to get all of our gear back onto the bus. It's really important to prep your students. It makes your life so much more easy at the end of the day. Absolutely. What's really key and some of the pitfalls that I've found is that you really want to ensure that students with wet boots keep them outside the bus. And people with dry boots put them inside each other and back where they got them from. Same size. PFDs are zipped and hung up. Indeed. And that's about it. It is. Our last interaction with the teacher is handing over the data collected throughout the day, our water samples, as well as instructions to culture that bacteria. That'll help them to take that information back to class and use it for further lesson plans. Another successful day on the river with Riverwatch. So if you're into the outdoors, environmentalism, science, Riverwatch might just be for you. See you on the river. See if you can team up with a guide who's been doing it for a while at the beginning. They can give you a lot of little tidbits that'll make your guiding a lot easier. I know I did and it went a, went a long way for me. Um, I would tell them that they should get lots of sleep every night. It's definitely uh, a labor intensive job. It's, uh, it's exhausting. It's great, rewarding, but make sure that you're getting your solid eight hours of sleep every night. The advice I would give a new raft guide is probably to have lots of layers prepared because there are some cold mornings. You know, those days when you have hard kids, you know, learn from it. There's, you, I'm sure you're teaching these hard kids more than you think. And so just appreciate it because these kids will never do this again. And uh, I think they'll get a lot out of it. Even though you're having a hard time and you're like, I just want this day to end, they're getting a lot out of it. Actually, I never thought that I would use my voice as much as I, uh, I did for a long period of time and sort of projecting it as well. So I would suggest actually putting lemon in the water of your water bottle. Enjoy everything about this job. Ham it up, play it up, love it, enjoy the students, ask lots of questions, be curious, and just be here every single moment. It'll be worth it at the end.